It's opening night for a young ballet company which has traveled 2,500 miles from New York City to give its first performance of a worldwide tour. Now let's add another dimension to it. You now must be Tension is high in the dressing rooms. Okay? Because what Arthur Mitchell, the company's the founder and co-director, is adamant that everything in tonight's performance be perfect. For 12 years, he's been the guiding force behind this truly unique company. A company that gets its strength and its heritage from the people of Harlem. Many people ask, is ballet relevant to uh, 1980s? It's the connotation that goes with the word ballet. The little girl's got a partner here and a bun in the back, and she's sort of insipid and dying. But any sequence of steps put together in time with music becomes a ballet. So I took dance, which is the essence, and then theater, and I said dance theater, and where will we be based? It's Harlem. The dance theater of Harlem is housed in a former two-story garage. One. Inside, Arthur Mitchell is rehearsing his students in the Patasis from Rhythmatron, a work he choreographed. His students are dedicated to perfection because they know their teacher is too. Arthur Mitchell is an incredible teacher. He has so much energy. Well, he's very strict. He expects near perfection. And it's helped my dancing an awful lot. You ever get angry with him? Think he's pushing you too hard? Yes. You cannot partner me. Unless you want to lift me, go ahead. You want to partner me, then partner me. The they called me the controlled maniac, and just to dance? give you an idea, on my birthday, That's the dancers came with this big box, it was beautifully wrapped, I said, oh, how sweet, I opened it up, there was a 12-foot bull whip and a package of compose. <laughs> I said, oh, you kids tried to tell me something. I all like that, but you cannot partner me. He's what you might call a benevolent dictator, and that's the only way it can be. One, two, three, four, five! Either you're going to do the glissade or you aren't going to do the glissade. Five. But why do you do the glissade? Because you're giving all the... If you're going to run, just, just do one, two, three, four, five, and you'll be okay. Sometimes I think he no, expects three, too much from four, us. But five. it's only because he loves us and he loves the company. And I know that he, as the director, has to expect too much from you. He always has to push you. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, why won't you trust that? And if he didn't push us, who would push us? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. There we go. For over 400 years, ballet has remained a white, aristocratic art form. Arthur founded the dance theater to change that, but he knows change doesn't come easy. 30 years ago, he began his own career at a time when blacks were considered physically unsuited for classical dance. It was a biased myth that Arthur refused to accept. So why did you want to dance? Were either of your parents dancers? At that time, there weren't any blacks in classical ballet. Uh, my father was a caretaker of two apartment buildings. Uh, I was raised in Harlem. When I told my parents that I was going to be a dancer, and also the fellows on the block, they thought I was crazy. And everyone started imitating me playing basketball like da 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 da, you know, <laughs> yeah. making invitations of me to do ballet. My father just really just couldn't fit figure me out at all. You know, my son's yeah. gone wrong. I, I prefer him being a doctor. <laughs> I did want him to be a doctor. That was my... Idea. I understand you went to the High School of Performing Arts. Was it a problem for you to get in? I looked in and I saw all these kids who had been trained formally, you know, in classical ballet. And I said, oh my God, what am I in here for? I said, oh, what the hell, you're here? Try it, Arthur. So I went and I went stepping out with my baby. They said, the kids got guts, take them into school. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I actually got into the school. And uh, after the first year, they told me I would never be a dancer. He went through a lot to, to uh, get to the top. He, one thing about Arthur, he does not take no foolishness from nobody. <laughs> and so I said, I have a lot of will, and I'm going to make it. Mary Hinkson came to me and said that there was a boy, a very talented boy, at the High School of Performing Arts. And they were encouraging him to go into modern dance because he was black. And they felt there was no future for him as a ballet dancer. So I said, bring him to me, let me see him. Indeed, he was very talented. Arthur quickly rose to principal dancer of the New York City Ballet. Greats like Balanchine and Stravinsky created roles specifically for him. He was an international dance celebrity when he gave it all up. You were at the top of the heap, dancing and on Broadway and in Balanchine's troupe. What caused you to quit? I remember distinctly going to the airport, and it was the day that Dr. King was assassinated, and I was in the taxi cab, and they announced that he passed away going to the hospital. I got very, very emotionally upset. I said, wait a minute, Arthur. Why are you going to Brazil 
when there's so many problems here in America. Arthur started with 30 eager children in the summer of 1969. People would be walking by and they'd see this man inside screaming and yelling, these kids dancing around. And I said, come on in and try. And I remember the fellow said, oh, I'm not going to wear those things, meaning leotards. I said, well, put on dungarees, open a bathing suit. And that's how I recruited dancers. The whole point when I started dance theater was to make it accessible to people who were culturally deprived because they could not financially afford it. If someone came to me with five kids, all five kids could study, not just the talented one. So we take everybody into the school. We have approximately a thousand kids in the school. And I said, oh, your instruments is your body. And if anyone ever tells you to put a needle in your arm, don't do it. A little girl got the flu and the doctor wanted to give her. She said, oh no, Mr. Mitchell said, my body is my instrument and no one's gonna stick a needle in my arm. She said, like, whose child is this? But those are the impressions that a teacher can make on a young person. Pull your stomach in so you look gorgeous. Once they have that pride in their body, they're not going to mess it up. Many of the youngsters have come from every aspect that you can imagine. Broken homes, we've had deaf kids, supposed to be problem children. After a few months, no problem whatsoever. What they want is discipline and some love and responsibility, which we give them. Pretty good. It's not enough to want to be a ballet dancer. You must work 10 hours a day, six days a week. A painful journey toward perfection. The dedication that's involved is like going into a monastery. You know, you've got to really just zero in on that time when the body can do at its maximum. There are people who have to dance. We all like to dance. I think everyone likes to move. But there are people who are driven by some force, some energy that they have to do it. And that is the lucky ones, I think. You already know at seven years old what you want to do and you are gearing your life. You don't think of the end results that I'm going to get old and I can't do it any longer. Once you've experienced it, you want it all the time. The magic of dance catapults these young people off the bleak streets of Harlem and into a world of beauty and grace. Even while rehearsing, you can sense the joy behind the dedication, a joy that they are eager to share. I really get a good feeling when I see little girls come and watch us in rehearsal, because that makes me feel like I'm leading the way for them. To make ballet more accessible to black audiences, the dance theater holds a monthly open house. We started having open houses on the first Sunday of every month. And we can get about 250 people in our big studio. We invite schools, senior citizens. It really is a full-scale performance, but for the community in a very relaxed way. We still don't get as many people in to see it as we would like. But the ones who do see come back again. And hopefully they tell their friends about dance theater and ballet. I mean, it was the fallacy that blacks are going to do classical ballet, and I was told I was an exception. I remember the first time they danced, and I considered myself very tough. I sat there and I started crying. And I said, there it is. It really gives me tremendous pride to sit there and see what all these young people have done. And that's why I don't miss performing, because I'm still performing with them all the time. And it's nice to sit there and say, hey, I helped make that happen. Whether they're performing for family and friends or for 2,000 strangers, Arthur worries over each performance as if he were dancing it himself. Really exciting. Well, there's a lot of action going on now in the stage chants and things like that because they, they've got it. But I still keep dancing every step with them. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, Stephanie, remember, keep the energy alive. Keep it going. You're the focal point, OK? Good luck, sweetheart. But the final performance is not the story of Arthur Mitchell and the Dance Theater of Harlem. The real story lies in the power and the ability of just one man working through ballet to change people's lives. Arthur Mitchell has dedicated himself to taking children out of the aimless life in the city streets and giving instead a chance to beat the odds against them, to fill their lives with a sense of hope and purpose.